Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Text 17, Chapter 7, Canto 7. Bhavatam apibhu yanme Yadi shraddha tate vachaha Vaisharadi dhi shraddha taha Stri bala nam chameyata Bhavatam api bhoyan me Yadi shraddha dhate vachaha Vaisharadhi dhi shraddha taha Shri Bala Nam Chameyata Bhavatam Api Bhoyan Me Yadi Shraddha Dhate Vachaha Vaishradhi Dhi Shraddha Shri Bala Nam Chame Yata Bhavatam Api Bhoyan Me Yadi Shraddha Dhate Vachaha Vaisharadhi Dhi Shraddha Taha Shri Bala Nam Chameyata Yati Shraddha Dhate Vachaha Vaisharadhi Dhi Shraddha Taha Shri Bala Nam Chameyata Bhavatam api bhuyan me Yadi shraddha dhate vachaha Vaisharadhi dhi shraddha dhatha Bhavitam api bhuyan me Yadi Shraddha Dhate Vachaha Vaisharadhi Dhi Shraddha Taha Sri Bala Nam Chameyata Babitam Apibhoyan Me Yadi Shraddha Dhate Vachaha Shri Bala Nam Chameyata Bhavatam of yourselves Api also Bhoyat it may be Me of me Yadi if Shadhadate you believe in Vachaha the words Vaisharadhi of the most expert or in relation with the Supreme Lord. Dhi intelligence. Shraddhataha because of firm faith. Sri of women. Balanam of small boys. Cha, also, 
me of me yatha just as translation prahlad continued my dear friends if you can place your faith in my words simply by that faith you can also understand transcendental knowledge just like me although you are small children similarly women can also understand transcendental knowledge and know what is spirit and what is matter and the two page purport by shila prabhupad these words of prahlad maharaj are very important in regard to knowledge descending by disciplic succession even when prahlad maharaj was a baby within the womb of his mother he became fully convinced of the existence of the supreme power because of hearing the powerful instructions of narada and understood how to attain perfection in life by bhakti yoga these are the most important understandings in spiritual knowledge then he cites three verses that say the same thing first is from shwetashvatara upanishad yasya devi para bhakti yatha devi tatha guru tasya itekati tahyartha prakashante mahatmanah unto those great souls who have implicit faith in both the lord and the spiritual master all the imports of vedic knowledge are automatically revealed very strong then from bhakti rasamrita sindhu atak shri krishna namadi nabhaved grayam indriyai sevan mukhi hi jivadau swayam eva sparat yadah no one can understand krishna as he is by the blunt material senses but he reveals himself to the devotees being pleased with them for their transcendental loving service unto him and finally from bhagavad gita chapter 18 bhaktyam am abijanati yavan yaschasmi tatvatah tatomam tatvato gyatva vishate tadanantaram one can understand the supreme personality as he is only by devotional service and when one is in full consciousness of the supreme lord by such devotion he can enter into the kingdom of god so that's the three quotes then these are vedic instructions one must have full faith in the words of the spiritual master and similarly faith in the supreme personality of godhead then the real knowledge of atma and paramatma and the distinction between matter and spirit will be automatically revealed this atma tattva or spiritual knowledge will be revealed within the core of the devotee's heart because of his having taken shelter of the lotus feet of a mahajana such as prahlad maharaj paragraph in this verse the word bhuyat you look in the sanskrit on the board it's in the first line bhavatam api bhuyan me bhuyat the word bhuyat may be understood to mean let there be in other words like a benediction prahlad maharaj offers his blessings to his class friend saying quote also become faithful like me become bona fide vaishnavas like he's giving his blessing that they can do that bhuyat a devotee of the lord desires for everyone to take to krishna consciousness unfortunately however people sometimes do not have staunch faith in the words of the spiritual master who comes by the who comes by the disciplic succession and therefore they are unable to understand transcendental knowledge the spiritual master must be in the line of 
authorized disciplic succession like Prahlad Maharaj who received the knowledge from Narada. If the class friends of Prahlad Maharaj, the sons of demons, were to accept the truth through Prahlad, they would certainly also become fully aware of transcendental knowledge. In the final paragraph. The words Vaishara Dhi Dhi that's in the third line that's written on the board here. Vaishara Dhi Dhi refers to intelligence concerning the Supreme Personality of God who is extremely expert. The Lord has created wonderful universes by his expert knowledge. Unless one is extremely expert, he cannot understand the expert management of the supreme expert. One can understand, however, if one is fortunate enough to meet a bona fide spiritual master coming in the disciplic succession from Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, Mother Lakshmi, or the Kumaras, these four sampradayas or disciplic successions of knowledge and transcendence are called the Brahma Sampradaya, Rudra Sampradaya, Sri Sampradaya, and Kumar, Kumara Sampradaya. Then he quotes an important verse. Sampradaya vihi na ye mantras te nish pala mata. The knowledge of the Supreme received from such a sampradaya or disciplic succession can give one enlightenment if one does not take to the path of disciplic succession it is not possible for one to understand the supreme personality of Godhead if one understands the supreme Lord through devotional service with faith in the disciplic succession and then advances further he awakens his natural love for God and then his success in life is assured It's a pretty unique expression by Prahlad. Specifically, he's drawing attention to himself. You know, the, the humility of a Vaishnava is generally don't, they don't do that. We don't hear them doing that. We don't see them doing that. But uh, Prahlad is doing that because in some cases, as in this case, um, Certain audiences, you have to be so direct, it's like impossible to mistake the message. Subtle messages are in, in certain ways more elegant. And sometimes elegance doesn't get through. <laughs> Subtle messages don't penetrate. So he's being very explicit. It's not, it appears to be drawing attention to himself. Actually, it's drawing attention to his spiritual master, Narada, <clears throat> because um, what does Prahlad represent? What does he have to offer other than what he's received from Narada? He's very clear. Now, these boys haven't met Narada. They've met Prahlad, their friend. <clears throat> but he's giving, in, in the previous verses you've been reading, what Prahlad learned within the womb, so it's, it's been described what he heard, and uh, transcendental knowledge, and he's passing on the transcendental knowledge. But he heard with faith, and so they need to hear with faith. The word shraddha means faith. It's used in the verse twice. Shraddha taha, in this third line down. And in the second line down, shraddha date. He's giving a 
Bhuyat, he's giving a benediction. Let it be, may it become that you will become Vaishnavas. That's his uh, benevolent wish. May you become Vaishnavas, but becoming Vaishnavas requires receiving. Receiving mercy, receiving disciplic succession mercy. Prahlad is a distributor of that. So it's not so much he wants them to have faith in him, he wants them to have faith in the words that he's speaking, which are the words of Narada, which is a, the message of disciplic succession. But it required to have faith in the words requires some faith in the person who is presenting the words. That's the message of this verse, <clears throat> and to support it, Prabhupada quotes three similarly important verses. Anyone that's a little familiar with Prabhupada's writings has heard these verses over and over and over again. One of the, um, one of the comments shared by um, a well-wisher of Prabhupada, who wasn't, you know, wasn't Prabhupada's follower, he wasn't a member of ISKCON, a Gaudiya Acharya, said one thing that Srila Prabhupada did very, very firmly, the, 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 the very first element within um, Rupa Goswami's teachings, he made so strong, Guru Padashraya. And there's so many examples of that. One that I like very much is, the, the, I forget the professor's name, professor somewhere in central Pennsylvania who is part of your ever well-wisher and saying, you know, he was a professor of um, Eastern philosophy or something like that. And so he came to know through his academic work as a professor about um, ISKCON. So he was interested because it's just part of his field. And then he started meeting devotees. And then he was astonished that these devotees had, as soon as they heard something from Prabhupada, they, you know, they were convinced they could do that something. Maybe you've seen that interview. One was told, you know, go start a magazine. So I asked the devotee, I asked this young man, have you ever published a magazine? You know, but he hadn't published a magazine. He's read some magazines, but reading a magazine and publishing a magazine, it's very different. But just because Swamiji said to do, that he could do. Guru Padashraya, having faith in the words of the spiritual master and Mission Impossible manifested. When Vaisheshika Prabhu was here, we, we heard some of the, the ways in which the devotees did. Um, when I was a college student, I received one of those Back to Godhead magazines. It was the first literature that I received. And it was from another devotee, Borijan, who was a college friend. And I didn't know what Back to God did magazine was. It's just, you know, the, the mimeograph machine, very rudimentary. It's like a, it looks like a, a barrel that you turn by hand with a crank. And, you know, papers would come in and then the, it, would, the, it would print out on the other side. Then they would collate and staple. And that was Back to God Ed magazine. You know, it got a little more sophisticated over time and gradually, gradually, but... Prabhupada gave an order and they, they just had to execute the order. There's so many. Anyone who has heard the Prabhupada memories knows what I'm talking about. Just Prabhupada would say and devotees would do. One of the ones I hadn't heard till pretty recently was that the Toronto Temple Maybe some of you have been to Toronto. It was a, a big church, big stone church up for sale. 
and the and the price was more than you know their years income from the place that they were renting and Prabhupada you know he asked them do you think and they were going whoa and he said you should do have faith so they did and it's still there more than still there it's you know it's it's a hopping place well maintained and so forth they've done lots lots and like needed and they've done lots and lots of work but just faith in the order of the, the mes messages Yasya Deve, the first one, Svetashvatara Upanishad. Yasya Deve para bhaktir. Para transcendental bhaktir, devotional service. Yasya Devi para bhaktir, tata devi tata garo. One who has implicit faith in both the personality of Godhead, in this case Deve refers to Krishna, the Supreme Lord and the spiritual master. One who has implicit faith, prakashante mahatmana, the, the, the all the transcendental knowledge becomes revealed to that person. Everything that you need to know, not trivia, how many windows there are in the Empire State Building or how many grains of sand there are in the Sahara Desert or not that kind, but whatever you need to know, Krishna says that. Uh, whatever you need to know to go to him, specifically. Everything that you need to know. And, and, and that's, you know, the, the knowledge of the Vedas. That's everything that you need to know from the knowledge of the Vedas. Depending upon your service and what's required. It's just worth going through these because Prabhupada has done so. It just adds emphasis to the, the, the force or the message. Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Atakshi Krishna Namadi. Na Bhaved. There's this Grayam Indriyai. Grayam Indriya, the, the dull material senses. You can't understand the Supreme Lord through dull material senses, very, not j only very difficult, cannot. But sevan mukhi jiva dao svayam eva svaratyata. But um, Krishna reveals himself unto that person who engages in his transcendental loving service, jiva dao, beginning with the tongue, tasting Krishna prasadam and vibrating spiritual sound vibration Prakashante, um, that's the previous verse, that knowledge becomes revealed. Krishna reveals himself. And then, of course, the Bhagavad Gita verse, only through devotional service. So going further, it, um, Prabhupada mentions this giving of benediction. Bhuyat, let there be. So he, Prahlad, he's fearless. You know, in, in the next room is Sanda and Amarika, and the next palace over is Harani Kashipu, and he, you know, his consequences are not on his mind. He, he wants these friends to become d devotees through faith in his words. That's how he became a devotee. I find it interesting in the first paragraph of the purport Prabhupada speaks of the supreme power. Did you notice that? Even when Prahlad Maharaj was a baby within the womb of his mother he became fully convinced of the existence of the supreme power. Impersonal. Because there, there are pe lots we meet. There's lots of people out there that have some idea of whatever it means to them, who knows, but the supreme power.
But to, to connect the supreme power to us, we require a connector. Otherwise, it's ephemeral. Now you see it, now you don't. It's part of, it's just the, the, a configuration of the mind that can change in a moment. One may become very disciplined in mind by process of meditation and other forms of bringing the mind under control. But it's still ephemeral because it's still the mind. That's chanchala. So how does the mind go to the position of transcendence where it doesn't go back? That's very special. That's some descending mercy through sound vibration coming into cyclic succession. That's the emphasis that Prabhupada's making in that second paragraph and the third paragraph. So although the bhuyat benediction is being given by Prahlad, some, as he's saying, some persons, they don't, um, do not have staunch faith in the words of the spiritual master. It's not just don't take up devotional service, period, but some of us, you know, devotees, practicing to become devotees, we may not have staunch, it's a nice adjective, staunch faith. What's that staunch faith? It, 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 it doesn't waver. It doesn't waver. Even, you know, like a candle flame that's in the midst of a, a, a strong wind, candle flame in the midst of strong wind, it wavers. But when the mind doesn't waver, even when there's a strong wind, that's staunch. Or um, the, the, the Sanskrit term is dhira. One of the um, classics in ISKCON is Srila Prabhupada in, in Los Angeles, where he stayed for quite some time, had different devotees reading from chapter 6 Bhagavad Gita, and they would read, and then Prabhupada would interrupt and comment, and when he was finished, they would resume reading you know, verses and purports for the whole sixth chapter. Topmost Yoga, it was the series. And I distinctly remember um, Prabhupada speaking about the word dira because it appears in the sixth chapter, same as a staunch faith. Dira means one who doesn't become disturbed. And then he clarified, to not remain disturbed, excuse me, to remain undisturbed when there's no cause for disturbance is not something wonderful. But when there's cause for disturbance and one doesn't become disturbed, that is dira. There's a, another very similar um, jewel amongst the, the, the passages of Prabhupada's writings. It comes in... Um, the story of Bhrigu being assigned to find out who is supreme, Brahma, Shiva, or Vishnu. And after describing how uh, Bhrigu concluded that Lord Vishnu was supreme, Prabhupada writes in Krishna book, it's not in the Bhagavatam. This isn't precise, but something to the effect that the greatness of a man must be considered in terms of how he remains undisturbed in provoking circumstances. So we're fine when things are not provoking. And when things become provoking, sometimes we lose it. Our equanimity gets tilted. Like everybody has their breaking point. Maybe you recall from, I believe it was the same year ever well-wisher where um, Nathaji, he became Nathaji, a disciple of Srila Prabhupada, who was previously, a, 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 um, and still is, a, 
an amazing industrialist, super wealthy man, said when he met Prabhupada, as businessmen will do, I was probing to see where is his weakness. I tempted him this way and I pushed him that way and I found that there wasn't any weakness. You know, he, and, and I, essentially, I'm good at it. <laughs> it's my profession. I test people's weakness and then I know where to, you know, where to attack. No weakness. No greed, no anger, just completely fixed. How does that, so staunch faith, that one can become like, qualified like that by staunch faith. Staunch faith in what? Staunch faith in the words of the spiritual master coming into simplic succession and so the, 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 the message, the deliverer of the message and the person who the message is pointing to, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, faith in Krishna. There's always disturbing circumstances, taxing, you know, the, the common word used these days, challenging circumstances. There are various challenges or obstacles on the path of life, always. Sometimes more, sometimes less, but always. It's just the nature of the place. So how do we deal with those best? It's not just, you know, so you can be peaceful. Rather, so that you can go to Krishna. And without disciplic succession, one doesn't know about Krishna. For us, it's like, that's not a problem because we, we know about Krishna. But lots of people don't. And they have some ideas. Everyone has a, a you know, coping mechanism to deal with circumstances of life. The, the, the Bhagavatam is very firm. This purport is very firm. Following th this message, when there must be disciplic succession. Uh, he, he quotes a verse that's found in... Um, Hari Bhakti Vilas, it has to do with mantra. And um, sampradaya vihinaye mantras te nishpala. What does pala mean? Fruit. Nishpala means no fruit. Nishpala, mata. If one receives a mantra, not in disciplic succession, it will not bear fruit. The other part of the verse says, if that happens, one then must again receive mantra. Because there people read books, yes. Or the reason they read the internet. <laughs> and there they find some mantra. And then you got the mantra. Because you read it in a book. But it, or for somewhere or somewhere receives the mantra, but without disciplic succession. Nishpala. And, and similarly, reading books without disciplic succession, bona fide disciplic succession. Nishpala. So the opportunity of hearing from Prahlad. He's a Mahajan. He's not one of us. He's a Mahajan. And he's, he's a Mahajan speaking to his classmates. Whew. How fortunate. But still, there may not be staunch faith in those words. So then it won't be fructification. And similarly, so we, we have the, this uh, social structure in his kind. I'm just now referring to um, some a deepening appreciation. I don't know if, if if all of you who are here heard Shivaram Maharaj's little message on Varnashram. I don't know if any of you went back and heard it again. It's that it's it's worth hearing again. It's really wonderful. Um, so many powerful messages within that presentation he made. 
One of them being, um, before even become a Vaishnav, one must become a human being. <laughs> and there's 30 characteristics, according to Bhagavatam, that are minimal before you can be considered a human being. And it, you know, it's a pretty strong list, so maybe we're not even human beings yet, trying to be Vaishnavas. Well, uh, let us take a look at how civilized, according to Vedic standards, are we? And I was specifically thinking of that in terms of, it's, it's very similar message to what I had wanted to present of, about um, Vaishnava etiquette as the ornament of a sincere leader and a sincere follower. Same message. Because using his language, some people consider being th th those qualities that are human to be an alankar, an ornament. In one sense they are, because this is the age of Kali, and people in the age of Kali, they're bereft of human qualification because of the, the, the negative influence of this age. And it's not speaking of other people outside of this room, it's all of us, are in the room and outside the room alike. And so, uh, etiquette is essential. And th this, this message of staunch faith in the words of the spiritual master being repeated so multiple times just in this one purport. Taking these instructions of Krishna from the, the Bhagavatam, connecting qualities with etiquette. Just as trying to recall um, the, the, the exact source. I can't recall the exact source. Um, one learned Vaishnav was speaking ab about Vaishnava etiquette and, and expressing that the essence of all Vaishnava etiquette is found in the gesture of bowing before a superior mother or teacher or whoever, elder, and touching the feet or at least gesturing in that way. You know, certainly when, in our culture, the culture that Prabhupada taught within ISKCON is we pay obeisances when we see another Vaishnava for, for the first time in the morning. And it certainly can just become routinized and ritualized. That's easy. And it's a whole other thing that we offer respect. Now, what are we offering respect to? We're offering respect to the person. And that person means the soul. And within the soul, there's super soul. So we're offering obeisances to the super soul within the person. But we're offering obeisances to the person, especially because they're carrying bhakti. We can say that. We're offering obeisances to the bhakti that they're carrying within their heart. Bhakti towards Krishna. And where did they get that? They got that through disciplic succession. So we're, we're offering our respects to he, our founder Acharya by offering respects to the followers of our founder Acharya. It's offering respects to him. And it's offering respects to the disciplic succession, Bhakti Siddhanta, and so forth and so on, and ultimately to Krishna. It can be a ritual or it can be devotional of something that's very meaningful. And then we can, with that offering of, holding of respect and offering of respect, we become eligible, as the verse is describing, to have transcendental knowledge awaken within our heart. I'll say the same thing the other way around. Same thing. Supposing we wish to have staunch faith in our spiritual master and we disregard Others, what's that? That's not what the spiritual master would want. It's not what Prabhupada wanted of us as followers to like disrespect one another. 
Kali Yuga, understandable. So there's this and that, but he wanted us to not disrespect one another, to respect one another. And in that, on that platform of respect, then we work out differences, whatever those differences may be. Just like in a family. We all came from some family. We all have mother and father and maybe some siblings. But in that context, you know, just expand that context. That, that what do the mother and father want? They want the, the children to get along. And there's different personalities. Anyone that's been in a family with more than, you know, even with two children, you know there's differences. What to speak of more than two differences, more, more than two children, so many differences. But I, I'm emphasizing here this, from the verse, this point of faith or, you know, Without respect, how can you have faith? Even before faith. If there's not respect, how can you have a relationship? What to speak of faith? No, the faith goes to Krishna. We're, we're fallible. Anyone here infallible? I don't think so. Myself included. Fallible. So, we're fallible. So how can you repose your faith on someone that's fallible? Well, you respect that they're carrying bhakti in their heart and their life is progressing towards Krishna. We respect that. And then, so based upon that respect, whatever there's, there's some differences, we work them out based on respect. And if there isn't respect, you can't, not only you can't work things out, you can't even have a relationship. It's so easy to give anecdotal elaborations on the point. Real easy. That, that, so, back to human characteristic. So, the basis from which association with saintly persons can come and then produce um, transcendental knowledge, awakening from within one's heart. Prabhupada is speaking uh, Atma Tattva, it's in the purport. The distinction between the soul and the super soul. Atma Tattva. And between spirit and matter. So supposing we hold on to our bodily conception of life. We're going to respect some and not respect others based on that bodily conception of life. And it can be, you know, subtle body conception. I like this type and I don't like that type. And I, you know, so I form a group over here and I'm against the group over there. And it's just, it, Krishna is obscured. And now we're practicing devotees where Krishna is obscured and we don't have the capacity to respect one another what to speak of faith. And then we're reading verses about, you know, implicit faith in Guru and Krishna. We have to go back and address this foundational area in our lives. And we're all coming from, you know, it's not like, you know, the births of Shukadev Goswami <laughs> or Maharaj Prikshit or, you know, elevated, elevated souls. Presumably, reasonably, one can say, each one of us in some previous life has engaged in devotional service. And that has entitled us to take, to say yes when we came in contact with Krishna consciousness, however long it took us to say yes. So we're continuing some previous unfinished devotional service. But you know, we're a, we're, we're a, a, it's a project to take that diamond-like 
previous condition of devotional service and polish it. I'm suggesting, based upon this verse, as Prahlad Maharaj is appealing, more than appealing, he's giving the benediction. Let it be. May you become faithful. May you have faith in my words, like I have faith in the words of Narada. May that happen. But then there's blocks. So certainly the process of hearing and chanting is irreplaceable. This is the Bhagavad Dharma method. Irreplaceable. But that's a behavior. There's something, there's the consciousness behind the behavior. Even if one consciousness is bad, still one needs to pay attention to consciousness. And the, I really like what, um, the more I consider what, what uh, sh the message that Shiva Maharaj is trying to pass on. Because it's, it's been a puzzle, big puzzle for Iskand. You know, how do we do what Prabhupada wanted us to do? In, this, in terms of establishing Varnashram, you know, the other 50% to help us become human. So certainly the strong emphasis on hearing and chanting and distributing Krishna consciousness, expanding the movement. Then, you know, the social structure for that, for that population so that we know what our position is and we become more civilized. We become more that the possessors of Vaishnav etiquette, along with our hearing and chanting, and then transcendental knowledge can awaken. So it's, it's more than theoretical. The, this is when it, something that struck me as Prabhupada is repeating this in the purport. It's not just theoretical, but um, realized knowledge. How is that going to happen? The, this faith in the spiritual master and the message coming into simply succession, the, the, the faith in transcendental knowledge from the scripture. It's a project. And we're in it together. We're in, in the ashram. In, the temple life, certainly a major part of, you know, in, in the missionary spirit, you know, the, the Prabhupada would say, our temples are like bases from which we send our soldiers out to fight the war against Maya. And then when we're here, we're not just fighting the war against Maya, we're to, to cultivate higher quality and based on that higher quality and the hearing and chanting, deeper realization. Like Prabhupada writes, one of my favorite purports in Bhagavad Gita is 241 Bhagavad Gita, where Prabhupada writes that, you know, the, um, the perfection of life is to be beyond the bodily conception of life. <laughs> and then again, where, where there's not even the possibility of engaging in fruitive activities. That's strong, you know, that's, that's the staunch faith where there, there's realized knowledge. It's not just like withstanding temptation because you have some brahmachari strength or some whatever kind of strength, but, you know, deeply realized where it's not even a possibility. That's the, that's the requirement. That's the stage we need to get to for this vyavasayat mika buddhi to happen. And without this staunch, implicit faith. We'll continue to struggle. That position won't be attained. So it's some, it's not like ominous thought, it's, it's something that 
that it will help the messages to help us recognize what our you know core ground level work is and attend to it any comments or questions yeah on the topic of um, dhira is a person who's not disturbed even when there are causes for disturbance mm. and elsewhere in the bhagavad gita and bhagavatam there is mention of manishi a thoughtful person mm. who wants to make sure things mm. Mm. are improved or changed such that you know the outcome is pleasing to krishna and then there are also persons who are really undisturbed with uh, dysfunction undisturbed with dysfunction dysfunction yeah they're not disturbed so could you kindly uh, help put all of this in perspective for me what was the last part could you kindly help me put all of this in perspective for me well yeah did, did we look at our founder acharya's example he's you know the the gold standard and when he saw dysfunction he exhibited he was disturbed now he wasn't disturbed for his own happiness he was disturbed in part he was instructing but the disturbance the, the apparent disturbance was not like our disturbance he wanted to see that things are properly utilized in krishna service and he, and he noticed all kinds of details without i give two examples they're really nice uh in the henry street temple in brooklyn we had a double brownstone rental we didn't own the building and there was like a walk up and then there's on the left side as you face the building that's where the temple room was on the right side there was another walk up and that was prabhupada's quarters of equal space big space in the front was a sitting area in the back was where he would do his work and then he had there was a little bedroom so you know that back area that's where the the deities in the pujari room were on the temple side so from his quarters the, the kitchen was directly below where he would do his work his study you know his tra translation work so there was a stairway that was locked from you know the inside but prabhupad knew exactly when the rajbhog offering was taking place so unannounced with his servant he would go down the stairs walk in the kitchen you know when it's like 10 minutes before the offering is supposed to happen and examine everything see kamandri you know you know what the kitchen's like that's 10 minutes before the offering and he would you know inspect everything and run his finger across the table and look at everybody so you know he he didn't even say anything he just what he was doing was must be clean there's some cooks that understand we won't name names they understand to keep things clean as they're cooking some don't they have to have somebody come in and clean up after them because they don't the standard the prabhupad wanted was as you're cooking you clean and then when you're done you clean again not when you're cooking you make a mess and then you clean anyway he inspected you know stirred some things squeezed the rice and then he made sure everyone was watching and he took something and popped it in his mouth right in the kitchen and he said i can do this and you cannot and he walked out so he wanted details he wanted he didn't want dysfunction another was in mayapur those of you that have been in mayapur you can think of the lotus building the kanch building wasn't built yet just there was the long building what was called the long building got a building today 
and then the, the Kanch building, which was the, the ground floor, was the temple. So Prabhupada would come down from his quarters, which was on above the, you know, in India there's ground floor, first floor, second floor. So second floor, down the stairway, and out there there's a little, um, as you walk down the stairs, there's a garden-like area. So he saw in a distance, under that tree that drops big leaves all the time, he saw a lota, and he didn't continue on the walk. He went over and, and pointed with his cane, what's this? And he recognized it was, a, it was near where all the Tulsi plants were, and it was the same lotas that they use in the toilets. So you can't use a lota that's from the toilet to water Tulsi. So he put it back in the toilet and get a proper loda, and off he went. So many nice examples. Uh, he, he, he was training us, but, you know, but, but he was also, he would notice details, and he would point out details, you know, dysfunction type details for training. And, you know, so n remaining undisturbed when even when there's cause for disturbance means the mind doesn't become out of control and when the mind is uncontrolled and operable is spiritual intelligence how everything should be used in Krishna's service and then one puts disorder into order the order meaning specifically uh, things how things should be arranged for Krishna's service And over a period of time, intelligence may say, just like, you know, where, the, where that bookcase is kept. It's sometimes over here and sometimes over there and sometimes, you know, different places. So at different times, intelligence, something like what Vaisheshika Prabhu was saying in his response to the, you know, stopping certain things. You know, the de details can be adjusted Intellig when intelligence is operating. Details are details, and details can be adjusted, but um, there are certain standards or principles that must be observed, and, and that, you know, otherwise it's dysfunction. You don't tolerate dysfunction, you, but appropriate for the circumstance. You don't explode over every little thing. You appropriate for circumstance when addresses what needs to be addressed for the purpose of Krishna's service. Anything else? Um, about respect, that uh, it's the prerequisite for faith. Uh, in devotee relationships, uh, in general, in relationships, by the time that the wall of respect crumbles down, that's basically the end of the relationship. I heard about 40% of what you said. I could understand about 40%. Okay. Could you understand everything? Yeah. Proper relationship. Just that's pretty much the end of the relationship. Uh, so how to avoid that, uh, that like wall of respect to fall? Also, how to mend it? How to avoid losing it and how to maintain it. How to mend the, the respect, uh, how the, to maintain the barrier respect. of the respect, yeah. Well, it's how to make it? Mend, mend, mend it. Repair it. Repair, repair it. it. Repair oh, okay. It. Well, um, you know, that's a starting point is go back to, you know, do, hit the reset button. By that I mean, what's the basis of respect? And here's a spirit soul. And within this spirit soul, there's some attraction for Krishna. That I respect. 
that when obscured if that fundamental respect is not there then that's the eroding that's where it begins now if once again if that respect is there then supposing there's something where uh, it doesn't seem right then you can approach with respect in, in, in appropriate language it says a you know the right language respect and here's something I do, it's not clear and then it, is there some opportunity for discussing and if if that respect is absent you know it's really hard to have a wholesome communication about whatever it is that person A is perceiving about person B that's n not as it should be without respect it's like you can't have a relationship you can't have a dialogue you can't you know you have to just continue it'll, it'll, it'll get broken further so go back to what's the basis And then this thing of culture, you know, that's another reality check. You're from Iran. Now, in America, it's not common that people respect each other. In Vedic culture, it's, it's, it's you know, you, the, the student brings something to the teacher. You know, that kind of like a, an American classic is you bring an apple or a flower to the teacher when you come for class in the morning. People don't do that. It was just a vestige of Vedic culture and a, a sign of an offering of something, of respect. You come bearing a gift when you see, when you come before a, a superior. Something that I experienced that was very, very much a surprise because somebody was trained from India. I was in the Brooklyn Temple and just walking down the hall and coming to where a group of devotees were sitting by that little reception desk in the front. There's a telephone reception desk and I came and they were in the middle of a conversation and one of them stood. The others didn't know what to do because they weren't trained, but he stood because that's culture. And then, you know, and then they just resumed their discussion. And you know, whether it, it's, it's it, in one sense, it's a formality, but it's more than a formality. So, you know, similarly, whatever may be, you know, within our structure within ISKCON, it's persons that are carrying some, some weight of responsibility like an elder person there there's some respect should go to that person fundamentally it's just how training should be if we're not trained then we don't we feel perfectly fine doing what people in america do you know someone has some something and you just grab a hunk of mud and throw a hunk of mud and everyone gets into the mud throwing program It's very, very uncultured, uncivilized. So if, if, if you, if the, if the, this is this Varnashram topic again. When there's a social structure, it makes things much better. Now, that can be abused in, in so many ways. Something good can be abused, but doesn't mean something good should be thrown away. If it can be abused, it needs to be understood properly and used properly. Just like, you know, computer technology, it, it can be used in, for a beneficial way, it can be used in really yucky ways. So, back to the position of respect, it be, it, it, the, it, the breakdown begins where we forget what the, what, the, what the purpose of it is, of offering respect. You know, our, our, hum, our human foundation gets removed 
and we go to an animal position, less than human position. So restore is go back and look at what's the basis of respect and what are the, um, the, 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 the etiquettes or the, the social structure ways of observing etiquette. And then within that context, if there's something that concerns me, I express it in a suitable, appropriate way. And if that's done, you know, dialogue becomes easy. Assuming the other personalities are similarly situated. We have to act to create that culture. We have to be trained and then act to create that culture. Now, supposing that culture isn't pervasive, we act that way anyways. That, you know, that the, the adage that says you should act the way that you would like the world to be. Not like, you know, complain about the world not being the way it should be. But act the way you would like, the, you, you understand the world should be. And then how you understand the world should be, should be from this descending method so that the light goes on. And I understand the distinction between spirit and matter. Now I have to navigate my way through this complexity of matter. <clears throat> there has, so the social structure needs to be there to help us because we're defective like others are defective. Not just others are defective and we're not. We need a social structure that can exhibit that form of respect in different ways. I really like what um, Shivaram Maharaj is doing. Yes. On the topic of respect. On the subject of? Of respect. respect. Okay. How does one who is... Um, you know, a relatively new devotee who's heard um, different philosophies from many senior devotees reconcile, you know, differences in opinion. So, for instance, if one senior devotee hears says your, this and another senior devotee says that, yeah, and then he hears you, and say, you're a new devotee and you're hearing this and, and then, that, and how yeah. do you, how and do they handle it? And then you go to one of the senior devotees and you express what you've heard, and they say, no, you know, that's wrong. But you say basically, well, I have a lot of faith in that. So, how does one reconcile the respect to um, communicate that? Well, there's different possibilities. <clears throat> Here's three. My dear proposed, can you two sit down and work this out? <laughs> and then get back to me with like, you know, a resolution. I mean, it doesn't have to be so graphic, but more or less. Um, I respect and I respect. I'm hearing this and I'm hearing that. Hmm. So I'm going to just pause out on, on that one for a bit and express. Then another model, because I've had this exact discussion with Kala Kanta Prabhu, exact discussion. A model that he likes is um, the family sits together and has an open discussion about this and that. And um, then, you know, the, the younger family members can understand how to offer respect when you have differences. Because ideally, the, the two seniors are modeling respect for one another and respect that I may have a view which is different than yours, your view is different than mine, and I respect you. And I respect your view, which is different than mine. You and... So, not always is that going to happen. And... Um, you know... Uh, the, the former model is like children in a family. Parenting model is if 
the father and the mother, it does happen, they have different views on things. They don't battle it out or air their differences before the children because then the children have to go, they have to take sides. It's, it's different but quite similar. And, um, you know, the, the, the especially using, you know, the, the frame of references, here's a newer devotee, newer devotees by, practically by definition are not yet mature, like children are not yet mature. So to expose children to this high level thing of airing differences, it's easy to, in, a, in a not yet mature stage to take sides and get bewildered because I, 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 I like mommy and I like daddy. And when mommy speaks, I like what she says. And when daddy speaks, I like what he says. And now I'm confused. I don't want to take sides. I mean, I don't, it's a, it's a, it's a standard rule in parenting not to do that. Work out differences when, when, when mother and father know they have a difference. They, there are certain things like, you know, should we go on vacation to such and such place or such and such place? That's fine, that's a family thing, but you'll like if it's some other strong issue. I mean, I was just in the middle of one where um, a, a, a new aspiring devotee doesn't want to go on to college and mom is saying, you know, arm twisting. College, and dad's saying, when you're ready to go to college, we'll take care of your education. If you want to do some other things first, like live in a Hare Krishna temple for a while first, that's fine. Yeah. You know, dad's like supportive because the, 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 the child is responsible. They've demonstrated responsibility. So, you know, like, so there's this trust towards the child from the father. And it's not like there's mistrust from the mother, but it's like, Controlling. And the child privately says, you know, my mother, she's one of the most unhappy people I've ever met. And it's not just because she's controlling. She's got all these views about things that, anyway, so there's the, like a disconnect. So, you know, the love that the mother wishes to give to the child. Anyway, so... On minor things, where do we go for vacation? Or we're gonna have a, a festival coming up, what should the menu be? Or you know, something that's not cataclysmic. But if, if there's like a fundamental difference, then best that they discuss and work it out. Otherwise, the child has to choose. It, it, it's just, you know, the, the tendency to choose between this one, that one is going to be natural and it's uncomfortable. Then there's a third, I said there were three. A, a, a third is, differences are permitted. I don't have to choose. I think that's wonderful and I think that's wonderful. It's, it's, you know, Bhakti Siddhanta writes about this in that really long purport in Brahma Samhita, text 36, the other one that's 12 pages long, because apparently Jiva Goswami and Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur had two different views. And we, find, we come across this from time to time, you know, kind of lightly mentioned in Prabhupada's purport. Samachari says this, Samachari says that. You know, our black and white or binary processor mind says, well, it's got to be either this or that. If this is right, then that's not right. And if that's right, then this one's not right. So the advice... Vishwanath, but, uh, given by Bhakti Siddhanta is both can be right. Now that takes intelligence. Bhakti Narayan Swami quotes, I've heard it 20 plus times, from a lecture that he, he was sitting right in front of Prabhupada in Los Angeles and in Prabhupada's on the Vyasasan, saying, uh, a sign of intelligence is being able to hold within the mind to opposite ideas at the same time. That takes, that's intelligence. Because the mind is a binary processor. 
If it's a one, it's not a zero. If it's a zero, it's not a one. If it's this, it's not that. But intelligence can embrace the mind says this is right and that's right and the two ideas are different. That takes intelligence and back to the frame of your question, a new devotee generally doesn't have that capacity. But through experience and training could gradually grow into that capacity. When you stay around Krishna consciousness, say, you know, live, live a life for a while where you're, you're on the path of aspiring for transcendental proximity to Krishna and near, nearness and dearness to Krishna. That intelligence is going to be necessary. You know, just back to the, your question. So in the beginning, I may not have that. That's an option number three that I'll have to wait till I'm a little more mature. But it's an option when we hear Go back and uh, listen again, just on this point, by Shesha Prabhu's answer to the question that was asked about, you know, leaving things out of the morning program, that, that question and how he answered that question. Very deep. I mean, it was simple, but very deep. He's a deep person. Again, it goes to principles and details. Details can be adjusted. In principles, we don't. So how to know what's a detail, what's a principle, it takes intelligence. If you don't know because the intelligence isn't yet developed, don't take sides. I like mommy and I don't like daddy. I like, I don't like daddy and I like mommy. And then it's easy for the child to go, you know, go to mommy when he gets what he wants and go to daddy when he gets what he wants and plays one against the other. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's not wholesome. You know, so those are some options. Anything else? Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.